So we will today discuss with uh, about a primarily resting algorithm. So we are essentially continuing with the RSA crypto system, and uh, last day we have actually uh, motivated the fact why we are study why we would study a primarily resting algorithm because we have to choose large prime numbers. So therefore, what we do is that we randomly choose two numbers, say P and Q, and those two numbers has to be prime. So therefore, we need a an algorithm through which we would be able to understand whether a number is prime or not. Okay. So, uh, for, so therefore, we were continuing with quadratic residues. So, I will continue with that, and then discuss about a primarily resting algorithm, which is called solvay stressen algorithm. And then there is a symbol which is which we need to compute in order to do this. I mean, or to compute or use this algorithm that is called a Jacobi symbol. So, we will see how to compute the Jacobi symbol efficiently, and then uh, discuss about some error bounds for the solvay stressen algorithm. Okay. So, this is the more or less the agenda for today. So this is a recap of what we were studying. Like last day, we saw the proof of this result, which is a Euler's criteria that uh, uh, given a number a or rather a, a, a variable a, okay, which is a quadratic residue modulo p, if and only if a to the power of p minus one by two is congruent to one modulo p, okay. So we proved this result, and therefore, in if this result is satisfied, then a is said to be a quadratic residue, right? If a to the power of p minus one by two is something else than this. That is, is not equal to one mod p. Then a is said to be a non-quadratic residue. Okay, but the thing is that a to the power of p minus one by two can have only two possible values. It can be either plus one or it can be minus one. Why? Because this follows from the Fermat's theorem. So Fermat's little theorem is a to the power of p minus one has to be congruent to one modulo p, right? So that means that if I so therefore, this result is the square of one. So therefore, it's either square root of one. So it's either plus one or minus one. So what we have discussed last day is that if this is equal to plus one, or rather this is congruent to plus one, then it is a quadratic residue, okay? But uh, modulo p. But if it is therefore, if it is the other way around, that is, if it's the other case, so it's congruent to minus one modulo p, then a is said to be the non-quadratic residue, okay? So this is a quite an efficient check because you can easily understand that we can actually do O log P Q, O log P whole cube, uh, number of steps to understand whether a number is uh, quadratic residue or not. Okay. Otherwise, what was the naive approach? We would have continued and found out, found out whether there is a satisfaction of the equation of y square equal to a. So that is uh, not not so efficient. So therefore, this Euler's criteria gives an efficient way to solve the quadratic residue problem. Okay. So now we introduce a symbol which is called the Legendre symbol, which is defined like this. So the notation is like this. That is, it is like within first brackets you write a and uh, you write p like this. So this Legendre symbol a comma p, okay, is actually defined like this. So you see that it's zero if a is congruent to zero modulo p, okay, and otherwise it is if it is a quadratic residue modulo p, then it is called one plus one. And if it's a non-quadratic residue modulo p, it's actually minus one. So this is the definition, okay, of the Legendre symbol. So you can easily see from this definition, the Legendre symbol is nothing but a to the power of p minus one by two. Why? And because we know that also the right-hand side, if a is a quadratic residue, is plus one. If it's a non-quadratic residue, it's minus one. And if a is congruent to zero modulo p, then the right-hand side computes to zero. Right? So therefore, you see that this and this satisfies each other, and therefore we can say that the Legendre symbol a comma p, where p is an odd prime, okay. So p is an odd prime means primes which are greater than two, okay. Then the Legendre symbol is defined as a uh, a by p like this. So the a, I call it Legendre symbol a comma p, and that is actually congruent to a to the power of p minus one by two modulo p, okay. So this is the definition. So it follows from the definition straight away, okay. So now, the next question is: I mean, there is another notation called the Jacobi symbol, which actually uses the Legendre symbol. Okay, so we'll see that uh, the Jacobi symbol is like this: uh, like suppose n is an odd positive integer, and the prime power factorization of n is like this. So you see that this follows from the fundamental law of arithmetic that I can take any n and I can Break it up or factor it up in as a product of primes, right? So therefore, you see that p1 to the power of e1, p2 to the power of e2, and so on, right? So therefore, I, this is just the factorization, prime factorization of n, and then 
the Jacobi symbol a comma n is defined as follows. It is defined as like the product from i equal to 1 to k because they are k prime factors and you actually compute the Legendre symbol of a with respect to each prime factor and you raise that to the power of corresponding e i. Okay. So, if this is for example, if the ith term of this is p i to the power of e i, the ith term of the Jacobi symbol is Legendre symbol of a comma p i raised to the power of e i. Okay. Do you understand the definition? Right. So, this is an example. Okay. So, therefore, for example, if, if you want to compute 6, 2, 7, 8, and 9975 so you are interested in computing the jacobi symbol okay then uh, what i will do is that first of all i will factor 9975 so therefore the prime factorization of 9975 are as follows 3 into 5 square into 7 into 19 okay so therefore from the previous definition this jacobi symbol is nothing but 6 to 7 8 legendre symbol with respect to 3 okay and raised to the power of 1 because 3 has a power of 1 here Similarly, 5 is a power of 2, so you compute the legendre symbol of 6, 2, 7, 8 and 5, raise it to the power of 2 okay. and similarly 6, 2, 7, 8 legendre symbol 7, legendre symbol of 6, 2, 7, 8 and 19. Okay. So, now you see that this is actually equal to 2 and 3 is legendre symbol, why? Because what is this? This is a to the power of p minus 1 by 2 right? by my definition and modulo p. That means I can do that with a mod p and raise it to the power of p minus 1 by 2 also. right? So, therefore, 6 to 7 8 if I take a modulo 3, I am rem uh, my remainder is 2. Okay? So, I can simplify this stuff. Okay? So, therefore, 6 to 7 8 if I take a modulo with 5, 3 is the remainder. right? So, therefore, uh, 6 to 7 8 similarly if you take modulo 7 it is 6 and 6 to 7 8 if you take modulo 19 is 8. eight okay? So, therefore, now this is quite simple to calculate. You will find that all of these values actually are computing to minus 1. Why? You can either compute this or check that this is not actually a quadratic residue with this modulo. Okay. So, therefore, this is either a non quadratic residue or you can compute a power p minus 1 by 2, where a is 2 and p is 3. Okay. So, all, all of these compute to minus 1, and therefore, if you compute this, it will compute to minus 1. So, this is the way how you can compute the Jacobi symbol of 6278 with respect to 9975. So, you note one thing that in order to compute this Jacobi, what we have done is that actually we have factored out 9975. Right? So, you appreciate the fact that actually if this number is quite large, such an approach would not work because factorizations I do not know what are the prime factorizations right? or rather it is quite difficult for me to compute those prime factors. Right? So, therefore, I need some other way out. Right? So, you understand the problem, right? So, therefore, but this is how this, this follows from the straight, straight from the definition and is quite okay with small problems with small values. Okay. So, now the main fight that is like prime versus composite how can I differentiate a number from prime? I mean, how can I differentiate whether or rather understand whether a number is prime or composite? Okay. So, we give you a result which says like this that suppose n is greater than 1 and is odd. Obviously, if it is even you can straight away understand it is not a prime number. right? So, if n is prime then I use this result that a n that is the I mean so therefore, uh, if a n is prime means what? So, if n is prime then what 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 is this Jacobi or Legendre symbol both are same actually. right? So, therefore, uh, I mean if n is prime then what we can say is that the Legendre symbol of A with respect to n or the Jacobi symbol. Okay. So, th this is actually congruent to A power n minus 1 by 2 modulo n. Right? So, this is quite okay. This I mean this follows straight from the definition of prime numbers. Right? But if n is composite then this actually may be the case or may not be the case because there are some primes which are called pseudo primes which also satisfy this equation. Okay. So, therefore, if I use this criteria as a primary testing mechanism, I have to ensure how many such cases are given upper bound of how many composite numbers actually will actually satisfy this equation. Right? So, therefore, but if n is composite, it may or may not be the case that the above equation holds for any odd composite n 
where n is an uh, I mean if n is an Euler pseudo prime to the base a, so I call that an Euler pseudo prime to the base a for at most half of the integers of a belonging to z n star. Okay, so this is a result. So therefore the result says that if you just choose any odd composite number n, okay, then at most there can be half of the integers of a belonging to z n star which will satisfy these things. So not more than half. Okay, so we may wonder why. Okay, but this is a fact first of all. Okay, so therefore you understand first of all understand why how this works that is or why do we need this therefore the, what we do is that our problem is that given a random number a okay which I choose from say z n I am interested to decide that whether that number a is a prime number or not. So what I do is that I compute the Jacobi of n with respect to n okay and then also compute a power n minus 1 by 2 and check whether they are same okay if they are same then I conclude that n is a prime number right. But the thing is that as I told you that there are some composite numbers for which also this equality holds or this congruence holds okay. So therefore we need to find out or rather I mean how many such cases or what is the maximum number of such odd composite numbers which will also satisfy this equation okay. So therefore what this particular last point says is that for any odd composite n where n is an Euler pseudo prime therefore it is actually not a prime number it is a pseudo prime. So it is basically a composite number you can see from this uh, statement itself. So if you compute the Euler uh, I mean if you I mean for n is an Euler pseudo prime to the base a for at most half of the integers a which belongs to z n star okay. So let us try to reason out why this is so okay. So this is actually an exercise from Stinson. So I have given you the solution for that okay but this is actually as an as left to you as an exercise there. I think there are some more parts but some parts I have solved here. So if for example you can define like this that is uh, you can define a set g n okay where g n is defined like this that is <coughs> you take a from z n star and you compute the Jacobi symbol of a with respect to n and actually the congruence satisfies a power n minus 1 by 2 modulo n. Okay. So, what does it mean that all these numbers essentially if you choose a and if you apply the previous test will pass right. So, now the question is that whether this g n is actually I mean I mean is actually I mean all of them are prime or not or, where, or what is the maximum cardinality of this particular set right. So, therefore, first we will prove that actually g n is a subgroup of z n star. Okay. So, if this is so okay, that is if g n is actually a subgroup of z n star okay. So, subgroup means what subgroup means that it is itself a group if you recall it is itself a group and at the same time it is also closed it is a multiplicative group. So, and at the same time it is also closed. So, therefore, you see that since g n is chosen from z n star okay, that is a belongs to z n star. So, it is automatic that it is a it is all the all the elements are chosen from a multiplicative group okay. So, what we need to show is that it is also closed under multiplication okay correct. So, now by if this is so and if we also show that g n is actually not z n star which means that it is actually small then I can follow this from Lagrange's theorem which I stated in the last day's class that actually the cardinality of g n will be smaller than z n star by cardinality of z n star by 2. Why? What was the statement of Lagrange's theorem? It says that if there is a subgroup then the order of the subgroup divides the order of the group right. So, therefore, the order of the subgroup is what g n cardinality and therefore, that has to divide z n star right. So, therefore, the cardinality of this obviously lesser than the half right you understand that. So, therefore, this cardinality has to be upper bounded by the cardinality of z n star by 2 and cardinality of z n star is maximum equal to n minus 1 if n is prime it will be n minus 1. So, I can actually write these inequalities okay. So, therefore, what we have to show is that g n is indeed a subgroup of z n star right and also we have to show that g n is not equal to z n star. So, that means there is at least one element n which belongs to z n star, but which does not belong to g n. So, do you understand the idea of the proof? So, what we have to show is that 
Gn is indeed a subgroup of Zn star. So therefore, what we have to show is that the closure property, okay, and at the un under multiplication operation, and at the same time you have to show that there is at least one element which belongs to Zn star which does not belong to Gn in order to show this inequality. Okay. So the closure property is quite straightforward. If you, I mean, if you see this property, like if you take A and B which belongs to Gn, so I can write like A. A, A Jacobi n will be congruent to A to the power of n minus 1 by 2 mod n. Similarly, B Jacobi n will be congruent to B to power n minus 1 by 2 mod n. So, now what is the corresponding Jacobi of A into B with respect to n? Okay. So, there is actually I mean a multiplicative rule of Jacobi and it is also quite straightforward to understand why. So, if you apply this, you can actually product uh, apply like this, like so you can write like it is a product of A n and B n. Okay, and therefore, this is equal to a power, if this is true actually, then it is congruent to a power n minus 1 by 2 into b power n minus 1 by 2 modulo n and therefore, you see it is equal to a, a b to the power of n minus 1 by 2 modulo n. So, therefore, a b also belongs to the group g n. right? So, why does it hold? You can understand from the definition of the Jacobi symbol. Why? Now, because the Jacobi was computed by factors of n, if you remember. right? So, therefore, the same factors hold for this and this also. right? So, therefore, you can actually factor them out term by term and you can split this out like this. Okay? So, therefore, and also I mean what you need to prove is that this result also holds when a b, when the Legendre symbol of a b with respect to a prime can be actually factored out in this way. Do you follow what I am saying? So, so therefore, what I am trying to say is this that is if there is a prime number p, so p is suppose prime okay, and then I compute the corresponding Legendre symbol of a b with respect to p, then actually I should be able to split this like this that is a with respect to p and b with respect to p. Okay. So, if this result holds, then also I can write, then I can easily write that a b with respect to n is equal to a with respect to n and b with respect to n. Okay. Why? And because I can factor out n, I can factor n I, and similarly I can apply the definition of Jacobi symbol, it follows straight from the definition actually. Okay. So, but and why this works? This works, why this works is quite easy because you can straight away apply the uh, de other definition of Legendre symbol which is the I mean a b raised to the power of uh, p minus 1 by 2 and from there it follows straight away. Okay. So, therefore, there is an easy proof of this multiplicity proof rule for this Jacobi symbol. Okay. So, therefore, you uh, coming back to this proof, so you see that because of this multiplicative property actually G n is also closed under multiplication. Okay. So, since G n is a subset of a multiplicative finite group and it is also closed under multiplication, then it must be a subgroup also. So, what we have next to show is that there exists at least one element in Zn star which does not belong to G. Okay? And therefore, you will find that there is an exercise given in your Stinson's book and uh, we have just uh, given you the sketch for that. It says that the question is like this that suppose n equal to p power k into q so where p and q are two odd prime numbers. Okay? So, you see that here it says that p is p and q are odd and p is prime. Okay? And it also says that GCD of p comma q is equal to one. So that means the p and q do not share any common uh, factor, okay, which is a non-trivial factor basically. So therefore, now if we define a, which is equal to one plus p to the power of k minus one into q, okay, then you can easily see that a belongs to Z n star. Why? Because if you take a and if you uh, take the uh, and if you observe n, then this n and this particular a number a cannot share any common factor, common non-trivial factor. Okay? So, A belongs to Z n star. Okay? So, what we now next to sh next need to show is that A does not belong to G n. Okay? So, that means what we have to show that if I take A and if I compute the Jacobi of A with respect to n, this should not be congruent to A power n minus 1 by 2 modulo n. Right? Yes. So, therefore, what we do is that you take A and take N and you need to compute the Jacobi symbol. So, you know the factors of N, right? it is p power k into q. So, therefore, you can apply this 
straight away and you see that this is actually equal to 1 because a with respect to p is 1 and a with respect to q is 1. Why? Because if you take modulo p and modulo q only one, re one remains, right. So, therefore, this is equal to 1. So, therefore, the right hand side that is a power, a, so therefore, this is actually a, the right, the, what is the right hand side of what, are, what we are checking? It is a power n minus 1 by 2. So, this we can actually do from binomial theorem, right, because a is what 1 plus p to the power of k minus 1 into q. So, if I need to compute a power n minus 1 by 2, I can apply to the power of n minus 1 by 2 and do a binomial expansion of this thing, right. So, therefore, you will see that this binomial expansion, if you take a modulo n, then only these, these two terms remain, the other terms vanish, why? And because k is actually greater than or equal to 2 by my definition, all the higher terms will be actually, if you take modulo n, will be divisible by and will become the remainder will be 0. Okay, so, you can check this actually. Hmm. So, therefore, the only two terms which will remain is 1 plus n minus 1 by 2 into p to the power of k minus 1 into q modulo n. Okay. So, now if this and this has to be equal, that is if a Jacobi n has to be equal to a power n minus 1 by 2, then the second term has to go to 0. right? So, therefore, n has to divide this number. right? So, n, what is n? n is p to the power of k into q. So, therefore, p to the power of k into q has to divide n minus 1 by 2 into p to the power of k minus 1 into q, right. And therefore, p has to actually divide n minus 1 by 2, okay. And therefore, you can rearrange this and find out that n has in that case congruent to 1 modulo p, okay. How? because n minus 1 by 2 has to be some integer multiple with p, right. So, it is k p something. So, therefore, n is equal to 1 plus 2 k p. So, if you take a modulo of p on both sides, then n is actually equal to congruent to 1 mod p. But we know that n is actually 0 mod p, because n was what? p to the power of k into q. So, we have a contradiction and where therefore, this equality is not correct. Okay? So, therefore, a does not belong to g n, right. And what does it mean? It means that g n and z n star are not the same, right. And therefore, we can apply the Lagrange's theorem and from there, we can say that the cardinality of g n is actually lesser than equal to n minus 1 by 2, okay. So, now, this is the main idea. So, therefore, you see that the idea is that, I mean, less than half of the numbers can be, at, at most, there can be n minus 1 by 2 numbers, which will satisfy this test. So, therefore, I can apply this test with a with a probability with a good probability of success. Okay. So, therefore, you will see how this uh, algorithm works in more details. So, okay, I have just given you this, I mean, so therefore, let us uh, uh, go through this. Therefore, it says that suppose n is a composite number, therefore, uh, there can be two cases a belongs to z n different z n star. Okay. That means, a belongs to z n different z n star means what? a is not co prime to n. Right. So, in that case, GCD of a comma n is what? Not equal to 1 and therefore, a Jacobi n will be 0. Why? Because the, in that case, it means that if I factor out n, okay, there, there should be one factor for which this will be 0. Right. If you factor n into its prime factors, then one of the terms, one of the product terms has to go to 0. Okay. So, therefore, from there it follows, therefore, it shows that, that there is a non-trivial divisor. Okay. So, therefore, you know that this number a is actually not a or rather is a composite number. Okay. So, therefore, you understand easily that this is a correct answer, this is a composite number. Now, what about the next case when a belongs to z n star, then GCD of a comma n is actually not equal to 1, right. Sorry, GCD of a comma n is equal to 1. Okay. So, in that case, solovay strassen can return a wrong answer if and only if A belongs to G n, right. So, that, that and what we have proved is that the cardinality of G n is maximum equal to n minus 1 by 2 and from there, I can compute the probability of a wrong answer to be maximum equal to half, okay. So, that is the rationale behind the solovay strassen algorithm, okay. So, now, if we understand this, we I mean the rest of the thing will be quite easy to follow. Okay. So, 
this is an example of a pseudo prime number for example if you take 91 and if you take uh, to to show you that really such kind of uh, numbers exist okay so gcd of 10 comma 91 is actually equal to 1 so therefore if this would have been something like a i mean since this is equal to 1 we apply our check so therefore it says that 10 and 91 if i compute the uh, jacobi it comes out to minus 1 okay and if you do 10 to the power of 91 minus 1 by 2 okay and take a modulo 91 this also comes out to minus 1 so therefore this satisfies my check the solve a stress and check but you know that 91 is actually not a prime number right there are non trivial factors okay so if gcd of a comma n is greater than 1 then a and n have at least one common prime factor so therefore this is actually quite easy to understand why it's so and we have understood why and thus the jacobi of a to the base of n is 0 and the condition is actually if and only if so therefore this condition is actually if and only if okay so thus if jacobi is 0 with respect to any a then n is composite but remember the choice of a is random so this is what i told you that if the jacobi computes to 0 then that means that there is a particular factor in the prime factorization of if i factor n into say prime factors and therefore in the computation of the jacobi symbol there is one factor which goes to zero right so therefore this follows from this fact that if i take n okay and if i compute like p1 to the power of e1 p2 to the power of e2 and so on till pk to the power of ek okay and i am interested in computing the a jacobi n okay then what does it mean i am computing i equal to 1 to k a with respect to pi and raise it to the power of ei so now if this computes to zero it means that there exists a pi or rather there exists a i for which a pi is equal to 0 mod p right and what does it follow from the definition the definition is what the definition this implies that a is congruent to 0 mod pi right this follows from the definition you remember the definition of Legendre symbol it says that a Legendre symbol p is congruent to 0 if a is congruent to 0 modulo p rest of the case it is plus 1 or minus 1 so that means easily that there is a non trivial factor of a so therefore what is a can a be a prime number a is definitely a composite number okay so therefore this is this check is quite easy this is always correct in terms of composite decision problem that whether a number is composite or not this is always a correct answer right so if this is not so that is if it is not equal to zero then there is a chance of making an error because we apply the next check and you know that because pseudo prime numbers exist what you return is actually may be wrong right but if you say that a number is actually composite then it's true because if i find out that for a given number a a jacobi n is not congruent to a power n minus 1 by 2 modulo n then definitely a is a composite number right but the problem is the other way down if it is satisfied then to understand whether a number is prime or a number is composite then there is a chance of making a mistake and what we have showed just now is that the probability is of making an error is maximum half okay that is the re reasoning of the solovay stressen algorithm okay so you see that if this number if this algorithm says to you that a given number is a composite number it is always correct so therefore this is an example of a yes based monte carlo algorithm okay So this is the summary of whatever I told you just now that however if the Jacobi is not 0 then we check whether it is actually equal to a power n minus 1 by 2 modulo n if no then it is definitely composite but if yes it can be prime it can be pseudo prime okay. So it can be pseudo prime in that case what we are doing is that we are saying it is prime so the result can be erroneous okay and there is an error probability but if you say that whenever it is saying yes it is actually correct okay so this problem is with respect to i mean not is prime but whether is composite that whether a number is composite or not okay 
So, luckily we have the following fact that if the Jacobi symbol is not 0 with respect to A, then GCD of A comma N is actually equal to 1. Okay. So, so, therefore, if the Jacobi is not 0 with respect to A, then the GCD of A comma N is equal to 1. So, this we have already told you and so A belongs to Zn star and for any odd composite N, N is an uh, Euler, uh, Euler pseudo prime to the base A for at most half of the integers A belonging to Zn star. And thus, we have the following Monte Carlo algorithm with error probability of at most half. Okay. So, this is what I am trying to argue till now actually. So, this is the working of the algorithm. It says it is a solvay strassen algorithm. So, you see that it chooses a random integer a such that 1 is less than equal to a is less than equal to n minus 1. Okay. So, for the first step what you do is that you compute the Jacobi of a with respect to n. If this is actually equal to 0, then immediately you can say that n is composite. Okay. Do you understand this? Okay. So, therefore, uh, what is the other case? You take y and you compute a power n minus 1 by 2. If x is congruent to y mod p, okay, uh, rather mod n, then you can return that n is a prime number. Otherwise, you say that n is a composite number. So, you see that whenever it says a composite number like this case or this case, it is a correct answer. But if it says n is prime, then there is a chance of making a mistake. So, the decision problem is, is n composite? So, that is the is composite problem. Okay. So, note that whenever the algorithm says yes, the answer is correct. So, error may occur when the answer is no and the error probability is at most half. Okay. You understand this? So, now you see that we need to compute this Jacobi symbol. Right. So, but what we have seen is that computing the Jacobi symbol requires the factorization of n, but we know that factoring n is a hard problem itself. Right. But luckily from number theory, we have actually some properties through which we can always compute the Jacobi symbol. Okay. So, I am not going into the proofs of these uh, properties, but it follows straight away from the, I mean in order to prove this for the Jacobi symbols, you have to prove it for the Legendre symbols. And the for proof for the Legendre symbol is quite straightforward. You can work it out and take it as an exercise. Okay. So, this I have already told you why. I mean, uh, this multiplicative property which we have applied for the previous thing, and this also is quite straightforward to follow. Like, so we can just go through them uh, step by step. It says that if n is a positive odd integer, and m1 is congruent to m2 mod n, then if you need to compute m1 Jacobi n then what you do is that you take modulo n and you compute m2 modulo n. Okay. So, therefore, suppose that m1 is greater than n, you can do this. right? So, therefore, you can take a modulo n and bring it inside n, bring it inside z n. Okay. And then you compute m2 with respect, I mean the Jacobi of m2 with respect to n. Okay. And there is another interesting result which says that 2 and n's Jacobi, if n is congruent to 1, so you see that n is a positive odd integer. So, if n is a positive odd integer, so you see that for all of these cases n is a positive odd, in, odd integer because that is the only case now if it is even number then there is no problem. right? So, if n is a positive odd integer, then the Jacobi of 2 with respect to n is actually either plus 1 or minus 1 and there can be only 2 cases where n is equal to plus minus 1 mod 8 or n equal to plus minus 3 mod 8. Why? why can there be only two cases? So, I have told you that n is a odd number. right? So, there are four possible factors. Do you see that? So, what I am saying is that uh, if you take uh, mod 8, right? then what are the possible uh, remainders? It is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Okay? So, this I can also write as 0, 1, 2, 3, Okay, this I can write as uh, 4, this I can write as minus 3, this is what minus 2 and this is minus 1. Okay. So, what are the odd numbers here in this case? The odd numbers are this, this, this and this. So, what are the corresponding remainders? It is 1, it is 3, it is minus 3 and minus 1. So, you have got 1, 3, minus 3 and minus 1 as the possible remainders. Okay. So, therefore, there are two cases here n is congruent to plus minus 1 mod 8 and n equal to congruent to plus minus 3 mod 8. 
Okay. So, in these two cases, this computes to either plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. Similarly, if n is a positive odd integer, then, then you can apply actually like this, but what is more interesting to note is that if you can write m like this, like 2 power a, uh, k into t. So, you see that in this case, what I am computing is that m and the Jacobi of m with respect to n. Okay. And suppose I can, so if m is an even number, then I can factor out all the 2 powers, that is all the factors of 2 and the and, and remain and, and be, I mean and so if I factor out all the possible 2 factors, then I will be remained with a I mean uh, what will be remaining an odd, odd factor right. So, therefore, t is that odd factor and therefore, you can express m as 2 power k into t and therefore, m Jacobi of m with respect to n will be 2 Jacobi of 2 with respect to n multiplied I mean rather raised to the power of k multiplied with t with respect I mean Jacobi of t with respect to n. Okay. So, this follows straight away from the multiplicative rule okay, and why it works is quite simple. So, what about this that is if m and n are positive odd integers, then if you are interested in computing the Jacobi of m with respect to n, then it is either minus Jacobi of n with respect to m or plus Jacobi of n with respect to m. Okay. And there can be two cases that is m is congruent to n congruent to 3 mod 4 or otherwise. So, you can uh, again follow similarly why, it's, why there can be only two cases. Okay. So, so, therefore, it is either equal to minus. So, you see that what you are doing is that you are computing the Jacobi of n with respect to m with a plus sign or minus sign as be the case. Okay. So, can you now say that how can I use this to compute the Jacobi of, a, of any two integers? So, you see that what, what, what will I first do? First, if m is greater than n, then I will apply this result and bring it within n. Okay. I am not talking about the trivial cases. There are some trivial cases which you can straight away say it's 0 or 1, leaving those cases. Okay. I am talking about non-trivial cases. You take a modulo n, apply this, do it. Okay. Next thing is that you check whether this number is an even number or not. If this is an even number, then we apply this result and factor out all the 2 powers and you are remaining with an odd integer value and so you compute recursively the Jacobi of this and this. Right. So, now you are actually you have got uh, you have to solve these sub problems. Right. So, in order to solve these sub problems you apply property 4. Okay. So, so this is an example to show you how it works. Like suppose I am interested in computing 7411 and Jacobi of that with respect to 9283. Okay. So, here you see that uh, 7411 is actually smaller than 9283. Okay. So, therefore, I have applied property 4 and I do a minus of this. So, why minus? Because of the check that is in this case minus was if m and n both are congruent to 3 mod 4. Okay. So, if you divide both of them by 4, you will get a remainder of 3. Okay. So, believe me for this right now. So, therefore, it will be minus this and this. So, therefore, now you see that this number is greater than 7411. So, what we do? We take a module of this number with 7411 and we are remaining with this particular remainder. Okay. So, now you need to compute this Jacobi. So, you, you see that this number is actually an even number. So, what I can do is that I can factor out all the 2 powers and this is what I am remained with. Okay. So, therefore, I have a 2 smaller problems to solve now. Okay. So, therefore, now this number I mean this is actually you can easily follow what is the corresponding result for this. Why? Yeah, you can apply straight away this result. And therefore, you can apply basically property 3, I mean uh, so therefore, this follows directly from property 2 actually. Okay. So, so therefore, what I mean, so property 2 is this that is in order to compute 2 with respect to Jacobi n, what you have done is that it is either plus 1 or minus 1. Okay. So, there can be only 2 cases when you are computing the Jacobi of any odd positive integer with respect to 2. So, so therefore, in this case, it is if it is equal to so if you take a modulo 8 okay so therefore if you take a modulo 8 means you take 741 modulo 8 what is the remainder 3 so therefore it follows in uh, this particular class it is actually equal to minus 1 so it doesn't matter actually because you have raised to it power 4 so it is either minus 1 power 4 or plus 1 power 4 you will definitely get 1 okay so therefore now you have to solve this problem that is uh, jacobi of minus 117 with respect to 7411 so now what will you apply? You apply the fourth property, 
and then again apply bring it like this. So the, now you see that this is actually greater than this, right? So what you do is that you take a modulo of 7411 with respect to 117 and this becomes 40 with respect to 117 and similarly you can again observe that 40 is a even number so you can factor out like 2 power 3 into 5 okay and therefore you can apply this result like uh, you can uh, so therefore again the previous uh, computation uh, the other property 2 can be applied and you can compute that this will be 5 Jacobi with respect to 117 okay and similarly the rest of the things follows so therefore you will find that minus 1 will be the final result okay so so what the idea is that you can actually compute the jacobi of any no, of any two integers okay without without uh, without actually factoring out n that is the idea okay and does it remind you of any algorithm like the way how you are computing this yeah so therefore this is actually like the euclidean algorithm itself Okay, so in the Euclidean algorithm, what was the maximum number of times you did that operation? It was actually log of n, right? Number of times you are doing that operation because you are dividing, dividing like that, right? Because every time there is a chance that you are dividing by, you are, you are basically reducing your problem, right? So the number of steps was log in logarithm with the respect to the input size. So similarly, here also you can reason out that the number of steps you are requiring to do this, that is, you are requiring to do this modular operation will also be logarithm with respect to n why now because in the first case also only if m1 is greater than n you are doing a modulo right straight away so therefore your problem size reduces to the field size of zn okay so therefore your input size is in this case with respect to zn the size or cardinality of zn okay and that is n so therefore you will see that the number of times you are actually applying this modulo operation can be at most equal to log n property 4 okay so property 4 is m by n uh, sorry, uh, right you are what you are trying to compute is the jacobi of m with respect to n okay and uh, what you are seeing here is that m uh, there can be two cases okay so it says that minus n by m or n by m okay so now what i am saying is that in order to prove this result first of all you have to prove that this also holds for the legendre symbol Okay. So, therefore, in that case, assume that n is a prime number and you compute this. Okay. So, there are this is actually follows from uh, I mean it is a number theoretic result, but you can try that I mean it is not so difficult I mean so what you can do is that you can you need to compute a power or other m power n minus 1 by 2 where n is a prime number okay. and there you can have to, you have to plug in these two things like m is congruent to n is congruent to 3 mod 4. So, that means you have to write this as like say for example if it is a multiple of 4 then it will be like 4k or 4k plus 1, 4k plus 2 and 4k plus 3. So, this way if it is equal to 3 it will be 4k plus 3 right. So, you plug in this values it will come out to this ok. So, I am leaving the details of the proof to you as an exercise so you can do that ok. <coughs> So now I have arranged this whatever I told you is a form of an algorithm. It says that if your input m is greater than or equal to 0, n is greater than or equal to 1 and n is odd, I am interested in computing this Jacobi symbol of m with respect to n. Okay, if m is equal to 0 then these two results are quite straightforward. You can easily return these results. Else if m is greater than n then what you do is that you return the Jacobi symbol of m modulo n with respect to n. Else you factor out m in this fashion like m equal to 2 power delta into m dash where m dash is an odd number greater than or equal to 1. Then you return the Jacobi symbol of 2 comma n with power to the delta and raised to the power of delta and Jacobi symbol of n comma m dash ok. So then uh, you use that either a plus 1 here or a minus 1 here depending upon property 4 right. So therefore, uh, I think I made a mistake here m dash is congruent to n is congruent to 3 modulo 4. So, so, so it is either minus 1 otherwise it is a plus ok. So, so you see that the main thing is that you are basically computing the Jacobi without factoring n ok. So, that is the main beauty of this algorithm and why this algorithm has got O log p step I think you are it is clear to you and each module operation will have actually O log p. So, there is a division involved right. So, therefore, the complexity of doing a division will be O log p whole square ok. So, therefore, or other O log n whole square. 
So the total complexity of this algorithm will be in that case O log n whole cube. So this is a very light bound that I am giving you. It's not so tight calculation, but overall it's O log n whole cube. Okay. So this is a polynomial time algorithm, right? To compute the Jacobi symbol. So roughly it's O log n whole cube, and uh, this is the the other details. Okay. So now we will conclude with one more application. Like I mean, so what? We, so now what, what is my problem? So now we have a tool, right? That given a, num a question that whether a number is composite or not, I can apply the Solovey-Stassen algorithm, and with the probability of error probability of at most half, I can say whether the number is composite or not, right? No, the question is whether the number is composite or not. If you, if I say it's composite, it is always correct. But sometimes I will say it's prime also, right? So in that case, there is an error probability because it can be correct; it may be wrong also, and the error probability is at most half, right? So now what what comes to our mind now? I will repeat this experiment, right? And I need and I would like to magnify my correctness, right? So therefore, now you can in order to compute this, what we are I, I will define two events like this. So A is one event and B is an, another event. Okay. So what is A? A is that event which says that a random odd integer n. Of specified size is composite. Okay, so let this a be, be the event a. That is, an, I choose a random odd integer n of a specified size, and that is composite. Okay. Similarly, I choose. I mean, b is that other. I mean, is another event which says that the algorithm answers n is prime m times in succession. So therefore, I am repeating the Solovey-Stassen test for m times. Okay, and m times in succession, the algorithm answers that n is a prime number. Okay, so therefore probabilities of b given a is actually upper bounded by two power minus m because each times it's half, right? So th there are probabilities lesser than half for each case, and all of them are independent applications, right? So therefore this probability of b given a is a conditional probability is lesser than equal to two to the power of minus m, right? But what we are interested is in the probability of a given b. What is a given b? Is that a random odd integer n of specified size is composite? Given that m times in succession, the experiment has still told you that it's a prime number, right? So therefore, what we do for this, we apply the Bayes theorem. Okay. So you know that for Bayes theorem, I will need the value of probability of a. So what is probability of a? The probability of a is the random odd integer n of specified size is actually composite. Okay. So for that, we can apply we can apply that uh, prime number theorem, right? So if I apply that. Then what we get is that this probability, because of the previous discussion, and since we have taken only odd integers, it will be two by ln n. Okay, so therefore the probability of a is actually almost equal to one minus two by ln n, because what we are saying is now that composite, right? The a is a composite number, right? So a, the a is what? The is a random odd integer n of specified size is composite. Okay, so and what we got from here is that it's it's a prime number. So you take one minus of that; it roughly gives you the probability that an odd integer is composite. Okay. So now you can straight forward, straight forward apply the Bayes theorem. It says probability of a given b is equal to probability of b given a into probability of a divided by probability of b. So now I'm not going into the details. You can see that work out. It follows straight away from the Bayes theorem. But the thing is that you have got a reasonably complicated equation now, formula now. Okay. So but the thing is that what we will do is that so we will plot this. With respect to two power minus two power minus m, okay. So we'll plot with respect to two power minus m and see which one falls first, okay. So you see that this is what is done: two power minus m and the bound on the error probability. So you see that although it really does not decay like two power minus m, but it still also decays quite fast, okay. And you see that for numbers of this order, like if you do it for fifty times or hundred times. Then your error probability is actually quite small, okay. So you see that both becomes fairly small and negligible values and can hence be neglected. So therefore, if I apply the Solovey-Stassen algorithm, I will not apply it for one or two times, but I apply it for say hundred times, okay. And if under hundred applications for m for each number of times, if the result says you that it's a prime number, I will assume that it's a prime number, okay. And this gives me an upper bound of the probability. Okay, and I may remember that okay that there is an error probability in that, but I will take it. Okay, so you see that we have reasonably good, and this is actually quite a primitive algorithm. There are much more developments over this. Okay, so therefore you see that 
but this is a very nice algorithm in order to understand the basics of primality testing. Okay. So what we have followed as a reference is the Stinson's book. So you can go back and read this. And next day we will discuss about some factoring algorithms.